So our uh, final speaker for today is uh, Chiara Sulprizio. Chiara is a senior lecturer in classical and Mediterranean studies at Vanderbilt University. Her scholarly work examines ancient attitudes and ideas for, um, about gender and sexuality, especially as they are depicted in comedy, satire, and other humor-based literary genres. These uh, interests are explored extensively in her book, Gender and Sexuality in Juvenile's Rome, Satire 2 and Satire 6, which will be published very soon by Oklahoma University Press. Congratulations. Thank you. She is also interested in the reception of, classic, of the classical past in modern comics, animation, and graphic novels. And she is the creator of the web archive Animated Antiquity, cartoon representations of ancient Greece and Rome. Tara's talk today is entitled Of a Different Color, the Ever-Changing Image of the Female Centaur. Let's uh, welcome Tara. Thank you. I'm having some technical difficulties. It worked just fine a minute ago. Do you want to use my computer? Um, I don't have it. I guess I could use it on the Google. I have it on the Google Drive. Because um, it's just, you this is. Something that's like screen yeah. Screen screen How do you? Because it was up. I have a flash drive. You can just drive. OK. Sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, Fortunately, we do have the time for this. Yeah. I'm we sorry. We have extra five minutes, so we can. Um, OK. Now I have to find it. Where did I save this to? Let me see. If you go to browse. I'm just, OK. OK. Now I'm going to put it where? Oh, here. Mm -hmm. There. Oh, Patriot? Like, yes. Okay. Just grab it. Where to go? Oh, okay. Perfect. Okay, great. Okay, so now I'm gonna yeah. just take it. I think you can just take it, yeah? Okay. Eject. Excellent. Okay, all right. Let's try that. This is Frankie's <laughs> Okay. Yay. Okay. Okay. Well, I might not get my videos out of this, but that's okay. You can use your imaginations. Oh, yeah. Okay. The thing is, I can't. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. So that was supposed to like move around and. You were actually supposed to watch a little bit of that, but that's okay. All right, so thank you all for being here. Um, while doing research on the reception of classical myths in modern animation, I happened upon an unexpected phenomenon, a plethora of female centaurs. Uh, these modern centauresses or centaurettes or even centaurelles mm -hmm. are typically of two types. Sexy, scantily clad, and devoted to their menfolk as they appear in their best known depiction, that of Disney's Fantasia, or uh, sexy, scantily clad, and warrior like as they appear in various comic books and video games. And so here you just see a kind of a, a few of the different kinds of centaurs we encounter in the modern world. 
All these modern representations got me thinking about ancient female centaurs, which I quickly realized were few and far between. And I started to wonder why that was the case. So I started collecting references to these creatures, and I noticed that despite their scarcity, and quite in contrast with their male counterparts, there was great variation in the ways they were represented, which shifted over time. So in what follows, I'm going to present a genealogy of ancient female centaur imagery, and I'm going to offer some brief thoughts on why these portrayals are so scarce and why they've evolved in the ways that they have. So I've created this very scientific graph for you guys today to track the progression of this imagery over time. It's very subjective. Um, and the little thing, that little line over there sort of meant to mean like Greece and then Rome, but you know, it's very fuzzy. Um, so this is meant to track the progression of this imagery over time for both male and female centaurs. Now in Greek culture, we have no origin story for female centaurs as we do for the males. Uh, recall that they were born from a cloud with whom the evildoer Ixion mated, falsely believing it to be the goddess Hera, or the, they were born from the son of that union named Kentaurus and the, his mating with the Magnesian mares. The earliest depiction we do have is this Medusa centaur on a terracotta cycladic pithos, which was found in Thebes and dates to about 670 BCE and is now in the Louvre. While this monstrous hybrid may at first seem an odd pairing, we think snakes, not horses, when we think of Medusa, it is worth recalling that she is mother to another equine hybrid, the Pegasus. Um, this fearful Medusa is unique but she speaks to a broader association of theriomorphic creatures in the Greek imaginary with otherness and unbridled sexuality. So think sirens, harpies, the skilla. This is true of her male counterparts too, and therefore it shouldn't shock us to see centaurs, both male and female, joining the theasos of Dionysus, often drawing chariots or serving as musicians or both. This occurs later for the females and the males in the early fourth century, but they're definitely present in this context throughout the Hellenistic period and into late antiquity. These Bacchic scenes clearly reflect the qualities of wildness or revelry, though the centaurs in them appear to have moved a step towards domestication as they make themselves useful and dutifully do their jobs. Now, um, it seems that the, I know this is a lot, so this is on the handout, this is gonna go by kind of fast, but um, the reason for the increased representation of female centaurs at this time seems to have everything to do with a late fifth century painting by Zeuxis, his, his most famous, or so we are told by Lucian, who claims to have seen a copy of it at Athens. He marvels at its novel depiction of a beautiful seated mother centaur, lovingly nursing her offspring as their savage but smiling father teases them with a lion cub. And here is two of many Renaissance versions of the painting, you know, <laughs> take your pick, okay. Um, Lucian mentions the image not just to emphasize its novelty, but to note its reception. People were so struck by its uniqueness, they didn't appreciate Zeuxis's technical ability, much to his frustration. It's tough to gauge the influence of this revolutionary image of the devoted wife and mother Centaurus based on this source alone, but its impact in particular on other Roman era writers and artists seems evident from the fact that we see this loving wife and mother figure again and again from this point on. So perhaps most famously, Ovid's narrative of the Battle of the Lapis and Centaurs from Book 12 of the Metamorphoses contains a clear echo of it. In the midst of describing the famed Kentaro Maki, he pauses to recount the exceptional monogamous and egalitarian love affair between the Centaurus Hylonome and her fallen lover, Silaris. Hylonome's dedication to her lover compels her to impale herself on the same spear as him after trying to save his life. We also see Zeuxis' influence on the creator of the famed mosaic from Hadrian's Villa. So we've got a late depiction of that uh, episode of Ovid here. Um, but here we have the mosaic from Hadrian's Villa in which a male centaur tries to fight off um, predatory cats that have attacked his female partner. Uh, D.E. Strong aptly described this as a, quote, terrible sequel to the Zeuxis painting. Uh, and suggest that it was modeled on a Greek panel painting or Hellenistic era mosaic itself. In these two instances, the figures are dedicated heterosexual pairs, though they have been robbed of the chance to reproduce. 
We do, however, encounter familial scenes with children in other Roman era sources, um, in particular the iconic image of a mother nursing her young. One example is another painting description, this time by Philostratus the Elder in his early third century series, The Imagines. He portrays an idyllic group of, cent of centaurs and their beautiful mates who are compared to naiads and amazons as they nurse their frolicking offspring. Um, next is the sarcophagus in the Vatican that depicts a tender familial group in a Bacchic scene. And I'm so, still learning about this image, actually. Uh, but in both of these examples, we see the clever juxtaposition of wildness and civility of these creatures as familial and loyal, domesticated yet playful. And it's this depiction that has been largely taken up in the modern era. The female centaur as sexualized fantasy girl, especially as devoted girlfriend or new mother, though more recently they've taken a turn toward the traditional role of their ancient male counterparts as Amazon warrior types. So you see both of those represented here. So how should we understand both the scarcity of the ancient centaurus and the shifting nature of her image? The scarcity question, I think, is easy enough to answer. Centaurs clearly embody hypermasculinity, and their cloudy origin story reveals not only their, quote, strong association with the negation of marriage, as Paige Dubois notes, but their lack of a real or human mother. The lack of suitable mates may also provide an explanation for the male centaur's tendency toward violence and rape. So on a purely symbolic level, this female centaur is unnecessary. She's a paradox. This may also explain why her image changes so much over time. I'm thinking of her in, ter in Derridian terms as a supplement. She's ambiguous, she's undecidable, she's both an accretion and a substitution. The imagery of cloud birth is especially resonant in this context insofar as it expresses their malleability. As Socrates says about the chorus of female clouds in Aristophanes' play, clouds can take up any shape they want. So in her early guise as Medusa, she represents an even more pronounced image of alterity than her male counterpart. She's an even more monstrous monster. But she can also be represented as more neutral, a more neutral kind of companion or counterpart to the male. And this is especially so in the Dionysiac context where we see them represented in similar ways. Finally, we see the female centaur as substitution or replacement in her guise as wife and mother. This is both literal and metaphorical. She's the actual means by which centaurs will replace themselves, even as she reveals the mark of emptiness that is their inability to reproduce on their own. Her representation as wife and mother also serves in part to soften the aggressively sexual depictions of male centaurs to humanize or civilize them. And since wife and mother is the only appropriate role for a civilized female human in Greco-Roman society, this is the image that eventually becomes dominant and which persists into the modern world in the hetero-paired centaurs of Fantasia. But interestingly, the Amazon warrior types that have become so prevalent recently move us away from marriage and family once again back to square one where sex and violence prevail. I will leave it to us. Uh, to ponder as a group why this might be so. Thanks. Thank you very much. Sure. Questions, comments? There's a lot of centaurs, <laughs> I know. <laughs> a lot to take in there. I can ask the first question. Sure. So as, as I was looking at this, I was wondering, what about Saturn? Like the other yes. ultra-masculine, out of control, um, theoromorphic, what about them? So that's a great question. I think we don't really see depictions of female centaurs in antiquity. There are some in the modern context, and I've even found one of a nursing female centaur, or excuse me, satyr, out there in the world from like the 19th century. I, my theory is that reason why we don't encounter uh, female satyrs is because they're paired with maenads. They have this sort of natural counterpart. Uh, well, I don't know if it's natural at all, but um, <laughs> when you think about them as a sort of artistic trope, they already have this female aspect a, a lot of times in their depiction. And so I guess that sort of fulfills a similar role. Um, but I, you know, that's just my theory. I don't, I don't, I'm not 100% wedded to that. Mm -hmm. um, 
So yeah, so I think they've got a, a, a partner. Right. Yeah, this is what we're. Um, yeah. So I noticed in all three of the texts too that you picked for us, which are great, it seems that the female sin pronouns are phrased despite their horse parts, not because <laughs> of their horse parts. Right, like they're still beautiful. Yes. They're still beautiful. And that comes across very clearly in Philosophus, which is that if we overlook the horse part of them, um, look at how beautiful they are, even where their horses. Zeuxis takes special effort to make sure that the horse part mixes in with the human Yes, part it's very natural, very, yes, a very seamless and transition. It also strikes me that each of these authors that you pick, Lucian, Ovid, and Philosophus, are sort of famous and, and self famous for taking genres which are ignored, or Lucian especially is like Mr. Novels. I'm going to grab all the bits and pieces and like jam them together, and mm -hmm. I promise you it's going to be worth it. Right. So I wonder if the female centaur is perhaps a meta literary figure in which to say, don't be scared off by the hooks. Just stick with me, and I promise you're going to see that this poem or this text is itself beneficial. Yeah, I'm going to write some stuff down right here, because I really like that. I, that's a great, because yeah, they're very like these like hybrid sort of style, right? Their literary style is very like hyb hybridistic, um, is that the word? Um, and so yeah, I like kind of like the idea of that um, of being a metaphor for kind of what they're trying to do. And I've seen some suggestions of that in some of the reading I've done about the Lucian in particular. But I do think if you t sort of step back, it's true that all three of them um, embrace the weird, yeah. you know, or like these sort of novel, um, yeah, this sort of mashing to get mashups, I guess we could say. Um, and so it would suit them, I guess, to, to a, kind of engage with this image because it's it's really not around very, I will say like in the literary sources, it's very rare. It's much more frequent in, in artistic sources and art and architecture where that we encounter them. Um, so yeah, they may be making kind of a more self-conscious play. And I would just sort of br broaden that even further to say, I don't know what it is about the Romans, but they really like to hug the monster. You know, they, uh, they embrace, this sort of thing in a way that the Greeks kind of don't. And I'd love to hear what people think about, you know, why that might be the case. Um, if it's something about Roman culture, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways we could potentially go with that. Um, but I think I like kind of the narrower focus on the literary, you know, what they're trying to accomplish as writers, too, and this being, she being a kind of like a, a symbol for that, or a, an inspirational kind of trope. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Talking about hugging the monster, I'm, I'm fascinated by this sexualization of the center, right? Um, uh, the center in the Sigmund culture, did you find a, a similar thing? I'm trying to think specifically of the friends in Harry Potter, how all the female students fancy them. Is that sort of equally as widespread as the that's a good example. So I, I focus a lot more, I will say, on the female centaurs than the male. I think in a modern context, it's interesting. Like Male centaurs are just, if I go back to my very scientific graph, um, they are just way more uniformly represented in. Um, but one thing that does happen is that they go from having sort of more negative associations as these like fighting, like raping uh, figures to kind of something a lot more positive. It's still the same sort of warrior type, but that's turned a little upside down as something that's like a virtue. Um, but the sexualization or the sort of you know erotic eroticization of it, I haven't encountered that much. But that's a good example from Harry Potter. And if anyone else has any other ones, I would I would be curious to hear about that because I really see it going back the other way for the f the female figures, but less so going the opposite direction in, just in what I've looked at so far. Um, Amy had a question. Yeah. I was sort of going to build off of what, what Jackie said. It also struck me as significant that the you know, two of these passages are supposed to be descriptions of, of paintings, paintings, right? Yeah. So it seems like there's a peculiar vividness or energia to uh, the female centaur, right, in both language and in the, mm -hmm. the visual arts. And... Um, you know, I think that's, as, as you were talking about, that's surely something to do with the hybridity of it, 
Yeah, um, and I don't think I gave you guys. I was trying to not make the font on the handout like nine point font. <laughs> um, but at the end of this of the Lucian passage, Zeuxis gets really mad because everybody's like, "Wow, this is so crazy! Look, it's a female centaur nursing babies," and he's keen to tell us that he's she's nursing one up top, but then also nursing one down below, which is really interesting. And if you look here, you can kind of see that. I had a long conversation with people about the dynamics of all of that, um, <laughs> and, um, but. Zeuxis is really mad because they're not appreciating like the technical skill that he's put in to the painting and the sort of aesthetics. And he basically says to his assistant, like, let's just take it down and go. Like, these huh. people don't get it. Huh. Um, and he's really mad about it. Um, yeah. So it's funny because it's like they kind of miss the point of what he's trying to yeah. do, yeah. Um, which may sort of circle back into yeah, some of this. Yeah. That's like, really interesting. Yeah, it's like, what, what is my aim as an artist? Yeah, what is, is the it, message? Yeah, is it the technical skill or, mm -hmm. you know, the sort of uh, outlandishness? And right. Novelty, but yeah. Wow, yeah. That's so, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm sorry I didn't give that no, no. to you, but <laughs> it's there. Um, and that's kind of the point of the story in Lucian is actually that mm -hmm. people don't get it in the way that they, that the, the creator, mm -hmm. that the author wants you to, mm -hmm. to receive it, interestingly. Yeah. That's the only one that I've I know of, and it's so exceptional that it's a little bit difficult to extrapolate too much from it. Um, but one thing I will say is, you know, the word gorgon is from uh, I mean, one etymology is gorgos, right? It's an adjective that means fierce or spirited, and it's often used to describe animals and horses um, in particular. And so the idea is like that the Gorgons maybe originally were just in general seen, you know, hybrid creatures um, that, that have a sort of equine resonance, but it's, it, it's all very tenuous because it all just sort of hinges on that one image, um, that one object. So yeah, she's very, very, very rare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, well, what I find it sort of striking about that is that I think he's trying to counter, right, the image of the centaur as this sort of marauding, you know, monstrous rapist, basically, and shows this very touching and egalitarian love affair, because she fights right alongside her partner and that's one of the rare instance of like a warrior um, female centaur from antiquity um, so it's it's sort of unusual I think um, for that but I also think you know it's Ovid and I think he just really wants to upend you know our expectations so he just sets this very touching centaur love story in the middle of this you know massacre basically or whatever that's going on but I think in the context of of this project, it's that it's still, even though she's, it, the potential for her to become, like, it's almost like he's lamenting the fact that she doesn't get to become a wife and mother or something, right? That they, they don't have a future together, I, I guess is um, kind of where I was going with it was just that you see the potential there for the, the transformation into, um, you know, the mom with the babies and everything, but it's not quite realized. Um, so, it's weird. Yeah, and like she jumps on him and like does this weird combo kiss CPR <laughs> maneuver to sort of revive him, which is was very striking. Um, it's like really intimate, um, but yeah, I think I, I like to see the Ovid as sort of this. It's like a transitional moment in some of how the centaurs are being represented. So we're moving away from 
just, you know, warrior here, you know, warrior monster to something more. What's that? Not that I, I, this is sort of like, I, if I recall correctly, it's like a story kind of inside of another story. Oh, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. Excuse me. Yes. So I think that it's not an immediate metamorphosis in this particular. The metamorphosis <laughs> Yes, right. Okay, thank you for yes, reminding me. I've gotten so deep in it. Sometimes it's hard to climb out with the Ovid. Yeah, yeah. I find it also really interesting in this passage that she is a warrior, but he gives a lot of space yes. to her. How beautiful um, she is. Self adornment, mm. which is typically antithetical to uh, fighting spirit. Mm -hmm. Combs her hair or her mane. She twines in flowers. She bathes a lot. <laughs> yeah, he really lingers over the like yeah, the beauty yeah, over her. But it's it's a kind of girl thing. She's like a Thracian filly. Mm -hmm. It made me think of yeah. Elfman and the Parthenon. I know. I've been sort of uh, that echo has definitely been sort of bouncing around in the back yeah. of my mind. And I don't, Exactly, I, and the horsewoman from Hesiod, mm -hmm. of course, who likes to, you know, do her hair and not clean her house, right? Um, so I know that those sort of resonances yeah. are there, but it, yes, I, I did notice like he really lingers over sort of, you know, her her re her beauty the regimen cosmetics. in the co in the context of this like crazy battle going on. So I think he's just real, you know, Ovid loves to mess with us, and so, you know, he's creating all these really interesting juxtapositions here. Yeah. Right, right. They sort of end end up together forever, you know, um, in this touching embrace. Which I like this image of it because it's this is from a very massive sort of mural, and the whole battle's going on, and this is what's sort of the focus in the front. So you can tell he was, you know, very influenced by the Ovid and wanted to like sh really showcase that. So I do see Ovid as sort of this interesting hinge moment between, you know, kind of what was happening before um, in these more traditional, I guess, representations of, of centaurs, both, I guess, male and female, and then what, what comes after. Even though the Zeuxis predates him, um, you know, it's sort of, it's obviously tough to sort of like reconstruct new lines of influence, but I do think like there's something like, different that happens here that oh, that sort of paves the way for Romans, I think, later Romans, to explore further the motif of these paired, loving, familial groups. Um, so, so yeah. Um, I just, like, wonder what you... I, I wonder why we as moderns are really fixated on these sort of lovey-dovey, sexy time centaurs. I, you know, obviously it's like boobs. I mean, <laughs> I think there's a part of it that's just that you can represent. And I mean, the original centaurs of Fantasia were originally, didn't have tops, but then the Hayes Code took effect, and so they had to go back and put tops on them. Um, so I mean, I, I get that there's just this sort of titillating aspect to it, but for whatever reason, we've just decided to sort of run with um, these, these sort of sexy girlfriend centaur. Um, and I, I just, I'm not 100% sure why, so I'm just very curious to hear what you guys think. Yeah. This is slightly different from the sexy centaur, but when you mentioned about how many monsters and um, that the modern, so building on 
from you monsters and modern animated representations of female centerists. What are your thoughts on urinal pictorial skills, especially the hugging of a monster and monstrosity? Yeah. So I once read that he loves the grotesque because it compels people to open their eyes. Mm. So even his most recent film, The Shape of Water, is very much the hugging. Like, yeah, very literally. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's. I haven't really encountered anything in just like on the scholarly literature. I haven't really been looking per se because I've been more on the animation side. So that's sort of where all this generate, you know, what the genesis of this was all like looking at animation. But I should go and sort of see what there is to be said about sort of monstrosity and its, um, you know, the role it plays in his, his films because I do think, uh, yeah, he's clearly somebody who really wants to, to play with that in the same way that I think some of these ancient authors like Ovid and um, Lucian, I, I think he'd dig them and they would yeah. like him, you know. Um, so that's a great sort of just recommendation, another avenue to kind of pursue. Um, you know, I, I will say another thing about centaurs um, is that, especially these earlier iterations in animation, um, it's a lot easier to draw animals than it is to draw people. And so why you get so many animals in early animation is just because of the technical difficulty. And so even for animators, drawing centaurs is, again, this sort of way to segue from something that's easier to something that's more difficult and allows you to kind of have the best of both worlds. So you're like, okay, I'll do the top half. Then the bottom half is a lot easier, right? Um, so that may explain some of this as well, at least in the realm of animation. Um, so yeah. Um, yes? In antiquity, it's pretty unusual. Um, they might have some accoutrements like a sword or a scabbard or something. I don't really see like a centaur in a toga, you know? That doesn't really happen. Um, and not, not that I can think of. Um, Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I know Chiron is such an exception, and actually, I I have a little bit more of this elsewhere where I talk about how um, he because he's not really born of he's born of human parents, and he um, sort of like the exception that proves the rule in some ways. So he is pretty unusual. <clears throat> But I, I think, I mean, I would just say about the clothes, it's just sort of part of femininity and adornment that there's so much focus on what these centaurs are wearing, but it's also that I, I think it speaks to sort of this mutability of these figures. Like, if you want her to be a warrior, you put maybe just the, like, the one in Ovid, you kind of just put the scabbard on her, right? But if you want her to be the sexy, you know, love object, then maybe she's a little bit more um, artfully adorned. Um, but I think that's just sort of a trope of femininity, really, is just that uh, women wear clothes and, and men don't have to. I mean, at least in antiquity, right? Um, so that would be my, just my running theory of the moment, but it's something we're thinking about more, too. Yeah. I have a lot of the same Because I know just culturally speaking, there are separate spaces, and I know that male centaurs prefer to wear, let's say, pretty caves, mm -hmm. dark spaces, or yeah. forests kind of Thessaly. Yeah. I'm picturing female centaurs, you know, kind of like how Bobby depicts them in sort of this, like, uh, decorated Circe Perry, you know, 
something like this weird amalgamation of different weird domestic and wild spaces. Mm-hmm. Did they share? I don't know what the version is. Yeah, there's not a lot. I mean, quite frankly, there's just like not a lot of mention of it. I think in the Philostratus, oh, I don't even have my hand out. Okay. You know, he talks about, um, uh, I think he says something about how they, how they live in Pelion, and its caves are most beautiful in the springs, and the Cantari days beside them. Like, when there are female centaurs around, which is not very often, they're usually in the same places as their male <laughs> counterparts. Um, so they're still occupying those wild spaces for the most part. Um, in that regard, I haven't seen like a centaur who lives in a house, you know, um, or a female centaur. I haven't encountered that at all. But it's just, it's not something that I think has gotten a lot of mention at all. I mean, it's, just, it's sort of vague. Like, I, I think that also speaks to sort of the nomadic quality of the of the horse, right? Um, they can't really be pinned down. I think that's probably true of both sexes. Um, but uh, but I don't know 100%. So yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you guys. Your